It's Reality Check with Craig Price. I'm an idiot. Four minutes in and I'm already wrong. I'm like a monkey. Hello, look at me. You're like a beautiful mind. I'm more like Forrest Gump. So (laughs) this is the Self-Esteem Weekly. This is a reality check. Craig, shut up. It's Reality Check with Craig Price. This week, Ben Seasonis talks about her new book, The Big Book of Apps. Welcome to the podcast. Great guest for the show today. We're talking all about apps. And of course, Beth Zisa's new book, The Big Book of Apps. What apps do you use? What apps do you need? Well, besides the Reality Check Podcast app, of course, which you can find at realitycheckpodcast.com. So Beth is here to talk about where can we find good apps and which apps do we absolutely need? I mean, there's so many to choose from. There's so many apps that do the exact same thing with just minor tweaks. And you don't want to just download every app you run into. Otherwise, you're going to have so many things, you can't even find the apps that you really need. So let's head to our favorite app store, fire up our favorite podcatching app, and listen to our nerdy best friend talk about her big book of apps, Beth Zeesness. One thing I love about the book, and we kind of talked about it off air, is right in the forward, right in the introduction, you talk about how out of date this book already is, which happens the moment you submit it to the editor. How do you figure out which ones are going to last so you include them in the book? That's a really good question. And it goes to a lot of experience and really a lot of research. So if I come across a new tool, and I do all the time, I use the tool, uh, a site called Product Hunt, which I adore. It's like the Reddit for different products. And Product Hunt every day has dozens and dozens of new crazy apps, fun apps. So the first thing I do is click on it. Does it have a good pricing structure that applies to my audience, which is either free or cheap? Does it have relevance? Is it by a company that's been around for more than two weeks? Is it something that has too many competitors and I got to wait until it kind of arises to the top? Is it something that integrates with a very popular tool? I look at the founders. I look at the, the scuttlebutt and I read other tech blogs. It's so funny when, when you hear about when a tool makes the nightly news Those are the things that have come out on Product Hunt and made the biggest flash. So I look for those kind of things and then I add them to a collection and the collection automatically adds itself to a spreadsheet. So for this book, I had more than 4,000 apps that I went through to come up with 450 that I think everybody will use. So I am very picky, very picky. And my guest today is Beth Zeesness. She's got a new book called The Big Book of Apps, which, again, I like the title. It's simple. It tells you exactly what it is. There's not a 40-page uh, subtitle. It's not called The Big Book of Apps, How to Understand, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so right off the bat, you are embracing everything I like. You're succinct. There's not a lot of flash because it's all about getting to the meat of the information. So when you were starting to collaborate on this book, when you started – to, to, when you start to gather information for this book, where do you start? Because there's so many apps. There's so many things. I mean, when I look at my phone, I don't can't even find the same app sometimes because everybody uses orange for like a year. And then, um, so every orange app is confusing. And then they change colors and I can't find a lot of the apps that I have. So where did you start? This is my fourth book. And rather than start with the basis of the kind of things I wrote about before, I started with a list of questions. What do people come to me and want to do? So if you look in the book, it's organized by I want to create a resume, I want to create a graphic for social media. And so the whole concept is about things that people want to do. And actually, I crowdsource that I asked a whole bunch of people, I have a group called the nerd herd, who are people who have pre ordered my book and kind of they're my tribe, right? And I went to other sources and I said, what do you want to know? And I started there and then tried to answer their questions in a very succinct manner. So if you look at the book again, it's got one or two highly recommended start withs. 
and then it's got a few alternatives, and then it's got some also rands. And they're not necessarily in that order for every person, but it'll give four or five or six ideas to for every question that people have asked. So what is the trends that you're seeing? So you said that everybody crowdsourced this. What were the major things that people wanted from you? Oh, oh man, email. Everybody hates email. They all want to figure out how to get out from underneath it, do it more efficiently, do it on the on the go. That is one of the biggest things. And then the general category of productivity and then another general category of organization. So what's the problem with email? Because I, I, I'm one of these few people who don't suffer from email overload, uh, unfortunately. I wish I did because that would mean I was really busy. But is it because they're just, there's just too much spam? There's just a lot of useless emails from coworkers and clients? Uh, they just What is the problem with the email? Believe it or not, just today I was looking up statistics because I'm doing a new session that deals with a lot of research about technology trends. So I was looking up statistics and the latest statistics, I forgot the name of the group that posted these, but the latest statistics say that people get between 90 professionals in an office, for example, get between 90 and 121 emails a day. 49% of those are things they don't need. So how do you get out the 49%? How do you understand what the other half are and how to respond to them? How do you get rid of the stuff? One of the most annoying things in an office are those ridiculous threads of email chains. Like somebody says, can we bring, what kind of snacks can we bring to the office now? And they're like, somebody chimes in, oh, so-and-so is gluten-free, oh, and so, so-and-so so just went on a diet, so-and-so is allergic to nuts, and you're CC'd on every single email. That clogs up email. That's just one of the examples of a clog, but that clogs up emails. The oh, thank you responses that you get. Oh my gosh, how can we get rid of those? And how can we determine in a long list of things and triage those so that you don't have to worry about the ones that you actually don't have to reply to? Those are the kind of questions that I get. Now, when I talk to my mom, she's not a business person. So this is, this is, she's my average American. That's who I always go to is my mom. She's 72 years old. She's, she's kind of computer savvy. She's on Facebook a lot. She's got her, her little iPhone going. How can I convince her that not every single app is really Russian spyware trying to steal her social security number? How safe are apps in general? (laughs) So my mom, who uh, unfortunately passed away, would, I think, be 73 right now. And, oh, my gosh, one time I, you know, I gave her the advice a long time ago to just, you're not going to break it, just try something. And she really moved forward at that point. But one time I took over her computer for a few minutes because I had to find a file and I knew she wouldn't be able to find it. So I said, hey, mom, let's get on this whatever. And I'll just kind of move the mouse around. And she said, Beth, you're a hacker. And I was like, (laughs) "Mm, no. So the 72-year-old typical person may not be our typical person. So, but when you look at the safety, in fact, they may fall prey to more of the spam than, than other people or more of the uh, problems. Um, but when you're looking at safety, I am so wary of so many things. I know too much to be um, happy about anything these days. The, the number of ways you can get into trouble are just huge. There are some little things you can do. Like if you have an Android device, never, ever, ever download anything except from the Google Play Store because they have a lot more um, restrictions, but not enough restrictions. There was something that came up very recently that um, there was a little add-on in both Apple apps and Android apps that let them capture everything that was happening. And even some of these things Well, (laughs) you're playing a game and it's actually listening to the room to find out what is on your television. Because a lot of us use both at the same time, the multiple device thing in in, uh, downtime. And they're listening in the room to find out what you're listening to on TV, to find out your viewing habits. 
And I realized that the two or three things I just told you don't make you more, <laughs> don't make you more feel safe, feel safer than that. However, here's what I do. I Google something. I Google, if I'm really distrustful, I'll Google the word hoax after it or scam or something like that. So I, I do a couple of little things that take almost no time to check out something before I download it. And of course, I get most of my things, you know, I, I check out things all the time, but I've done due diligence before I even give it a try. Now, are there certain apps like, I know that my wife uses LastPass, and that is a password kind of storehouse, that because she, she doesn't remember all her passwords, and so she puts in the LastPass, but... How hackable is that where all of a sudden it's just like going into one place instead of having to go to every app that she has? Well, people ask me all the time because I recommend LastPass and they say, is LastPass safe? And the answer is no, 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 no. Nothing is safe if you're online. However, LastPass is a lot more secure than your memory or the elaborate sticky note system around your main monitor or the cleverly disguised password list that you have on your computer that is named a password. This <laughs> happens all the time. So LastPass itself is stored in the cloud, and a lot of people are very concerned about that. LastPass is one of the top five password companies, and that's another thing that I look at. You know, you would never want to go with Joe's password service because as soon as Joe gets a girlfriend and moves out of his parents' garage, he's not going to monitor it anymore. And if LastPass is hacked, let me, let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, Gmail went down. That was the last. Gmail went down within 40 seconds, I think. It was on Twitter. Within 10 minutes, it was on some major tech blogs. And it was down for like, oh gosh, was it down for 40 minutes to like 40% of the country or the world? Something like that. It was on news. It made the news. So Walter Cronkite would have been talking about Gmail going down. And that's the kind of tool you want to go with so that you get, you know, that, that what you're getting is as high as it possibly can be. I'm going to talk for another second about LastPass and, uh, and password managers in particular. There's a big mistake that people make in storing their passwords in their browser. So it says, hey, you want me to save this for you? And you're like, well, yeah, because it's hard. Everybody should have a unique, unguessable password for every site. But when you save them there, it's not very secure. Another mistake they make that is huge is using the same password over and over again. And that's so tempting because we can't remember it. So LastPass will help you with this. LastPass has some alternatives which are really cool in that they're not stored in the cloud. So if you are concerned about it being out there in the cloud, the cloud being hacked, some of these tools will let you store them locally. Now, there's a danger there, of course, about somebody hacking into your personal computer or your computer dying and you not being able to get the information back. And that's kind of a bummer. But there are some alternatives that give you a, a different concept. I just had a friend of mine lament the fact that he had one Bitcoin on an old computer from 2011 when it first came out and that the hard, the hard drive crashed and he couldn't get access to the... He lost it because it's, it's encryption and it's on there, it's on local. And he, he hadn't thought about it for years until now it's $8,000 so he's like, uh, per Bitcoin, and he's like, yeah, I think I'm out $700,000 because my hard drive crashed and I, wasn't, I didn't even think about it. So you can lose everything as far as your passwords go, but isn't password retrieval s somewhat easier than it used to be? Oh, definitely, but you don't want to get in the habit, you know, if you're a busy professional, I, I see it with my husband all the time because bless his heart, that's what we say sometimes, he will not use these password managers. And he, so he goes to log into something. He first tries three times the ones he usually uses. And then he cusses. And then he has to reset it. And then he has to wait for the confirmation email. And then sometimes he has to use two-factor authentication, which is something you should use. And put in an extra code and stuff like that. So that's 
three or four minutes of lost productivity. And that may not sound like a lot, but if you think about one of the things that that has happened to our productivity is that we're constantly interrupted. And there was a study, it was a, this is a couple years old now, but there was a study by Microsoft that said that coders, they gave coders a task and they interrupted half the coders. Coders who were interrupted even with a two minute something took up to four zero forty minutes to get back to the topic and to get back into work. So, Here's your busy productivity or here's your busy professional who is trying to get things done and he's instead cussing and getting frustrated at a computer and taking several more minutes to get back into the flow of things. Well, we're cracking the whip on them. So give me some of your top apps because there's so many and this it covers such a wide swath. There's no way we could even cover the 13 different topics you have because you got organize, collaborate, communicate, reference, utility, security, travel, Delegate, finance, personal growth, health, photo and video design, all these things. We couldn't even possibly cover all these today. So give me just whatever whatever reference point you want to give me, but give me like five of your best apps that everybody needs. If anybody leaves the house and gets on an airplane, you need TripIt. Now, Google is doing a better job of organizing your travel if you use uh, the Google infrastructure, but TripIt for free, lets you forward every confirmation that you get from a hotel and, a, and an airplane or whatever. And then when you go to take that trip, it's all organized into one trip. This saves you getting in the taxi or getting in the Uber or whatever, calling up an Uber. Uh, when you get off a plane and they say, where to? And you're like, I have no idea. And then you're digging through a bag. Well, if you use Southwest a lot like I do, because I love TripIt. I love TripIt Pro. I use TripIt Pro. Yep. For a while, it doesn't happen as often because they've kind of changed their rules a little bit. But Southwest would give you refunds if you. So if you bought a yes. ticket at five hundred dollars, and then all of a sudden that same ticket is four hundred and twenty-two, you could get that that eighty-eight that seventy-eight dollars back. You could you would you, your trip it would come up and tell you, and then you just make a phone call, and boom, it's done. So sometimes, and I haven't done this because I haven't traveled as much, but I'd actually get the money back for the money I invested in pro. I would almost always one trip a year would find a way to save me money to counteract the cost of the, the app. I know it's only $49 a year or something like that. And for the first three years I paid nothing because of those refunds. So we've got trip it pro or trip it in general. Um, what else do you, what do you think uh, every single person in the world needs? The free version of zoom Zoom is an HD video conferencing tool that gives you up to 40 minutes of screen time for up to 50 people for free. And I find it a very lightweight tool for a conversation. So the connections seem to be very stable. I find it very easy to use. If you're doing a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody and videoing or, or, you know, video chatting or what have you, it's, 100% free. There's not a time limit. And it's only $99 a year if you want to use it for, for a professional tool or for longer uh, events. If you go into a sales meeting or your nonprofit meeting and say, hey, you know, we want to save the company a little bit of money. So we're going to use the free version. Now all of our meetings are absolutely going to be no longer than 35 minutes. Uh, that's a win. Everybody loves you and you are doing that productivity thing. Does that uh, replace Skype to a lot, for a lot of people, or you just you find it more useful in general for, for a lot of other th reasons? I consider, and we're using Skype right now, and it, it's working perfectly, uh, and it's got a lot of cool integrations these days. But I kind of consider Skype the um, the uh, grand uncle of this world, and I don't. I don't know. Maybe I'm just biased, but I don't feel like it's innovated like some of the other areas, and I don't feel like it's as user friendly as some of the other areas. Oh or no, some of the other tools. It's gotten worse since Microsoft bought it out. I, I will give you that. In fact, uh, a lot of the recorders are gone. I've I've been trying to find new and more innovative ways to get uh, podcasting. Now that I live in the sunny California area instead of t Texas, I used to do podcasts face to face a lot of times. I'm trying to now. I have to do my podcasts cross country with I my other. So we have to 
find ways to do that. And Skype has been the only way I can find something consistent. But I know there's better things out there, and I don't have the time to investigate all these things. So I totally agree with you. Skype is a little bit antiquated. Um, what else you got for us? Got well, I think everybody needs in, uh, in their toolkit – some kind of tool to make instant videos. There are so many ways and so many reasons to make an instant video. And that's a video that comes from little video clips and little pictures. Facebook does it automatically for you. Google Photos is doing it automatically for you these days. Even iPhone, I'm not sure about, well, I guess Google Photos on Android. Um, I use also Animoto and Majesto. And seriously, on the go, you just upload some pictures, upload little video clips if you want to, choose a theme, choose a song, press a button. My record is 91 seconds to create a whole bunch of videos and pictures from a party or an event that I've been speaking at and turn it into a video that I can show. It's just so helpful for you know, soccer games and family get togethers and church events and wedding events and any kind of business thing. You can showcase your products, but you can also show the human side of your company. Now with unlimited data, that sounds great, but they've kind of slowly moved away from unlimited data for a lot of companies. How are we managing our data so that we don't get overwhelmed so if you have a 30-day period, by the 20th day, you're out of data and you're paying extra. That's a tough question. I say to people, make use of Wi-Fi, and then I say, but don't use public Wi-Fi. So I'm totally contradicting myself because there are some really big problems in using public Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. However, if you use Wi-Fi, especially for these kind of limited, very quick processes – you're definitely going like like uploading the pictures to do a quick video. You're definitely going to benefit from that. There's a site called fast.com. It's run by Netflix and fast.com in seconds tells you as soon as you go there how fast your connection is. So, you know, it's going to be really frustrating to you if you go to an event or what have you and the Wi-Fi is really slow. But if you go to an event and the Wi-Fi is good, you can create these on the go without hitting your data. Well, before I let you go, what is your favorite app that we haven't talked about? What's the one that you – doesn't matter what it is. It could be some, a stupid Snapchat filter. It could be anything you like. What is your favorite go-to app that you use constantly? You know what? I am going to <laughs> – I'm going to really show uh, how completely non – technical I am when it comes to games but um I spend oh no I'll tell you one that's work related rather than <laughs> embarrassing myself with a game flipboard flipboard is an on the go personalized magazine service and I promise you that I spend hours every week hours flipping through articles in flipboard I put all of my tech blogs into Flipboard. I put cupcake recipes or cupcake sites into Flipboard. And very quickly, I can literally flip through 20, 30 articles that are in my industry or just amuse me or what have you. I have news in there as well, keeping up with the news. And I'm showing my finger here. Y'all can't see it, but I'm showing my thumb here where I'm flicking up. Because in just a matter of seconds, I get all the headlines I want. I can get into it. And constantly, every time I have a few minutes, even here at the house in the evenings, I'm flipping through Flipboard to get new ideas and to get new cupcake recipes. Well, there's nothing wrong with getting cupcake recipes. That's the lifeblood for a lot of people at work is how we get through the day is a cupcake once in a while. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Now, all of the apps that you've talked about, we did not discuss ahead of time. And I, I bring this up because you know your stuff. So we didn't discuss which apps we were going to talk about. And yet, you know all this information off the top of your head. You're really steeped in this. And so I want people to know where can they find you if they want to hire you to come speak in an event or, you know, just get more information from you. What a wonderful question. Oh, <laughs> what a wonderful host. I am at www, which you don't have to use, 
yournerdybestfriend.com. And I did say nerdy, not dirty, because that mistake has been made. But I'm your nerdy best friend, the one you go to when you need apps. I got, I received three different notes today about, hey, Beth, do you know anything about this kind of app? And that's what I do. I'm your nerdy best friend. So I speak, I write, and I share all from the nerdy perspective so I can be that resource for people. That's the show. Thanks to Beth for joining us. You can find the podcast on Twitter at RealityCheckPod. You can like the Facebook page. And if you have any guest suggestions, comments, or questions, please email Craig at SpeakerCraigPrice.com. See you next time.